Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we've got a, a mix tonight of folks from uh, from BJ and folks from the the Addis community. So I want to wish wish everybody a uh, a welcome. Lots of excitement in the Zoom. That's that, that's that's great to see. Uh, uh, I'm Cantor David Mintz, director of the Center for Prayer and Spirituality uh, at, at BJ, and it is uh, such a privilege uh, to welcome to welcome back um, Rabbi Sarah Krinsky, who was a Marshall T. Meyer Fellow at BJ from uh, 2016 to 2018. Um, for some some wonderful learning on 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 pure kea vote, um, Sarah, it's so great to to, to have you here. Um, uh, Sarah is the uh, is assistant rabbi at uh, Addis Israel Congregation, in Washington D to Washington D.C. She received ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary in 2018 and holds a, a B.A. from from Yale. Um, she served as a member of the Rabbinical Assembly's Social Justice and Public Policy staff um, and a legislative assistant at the Religious Action, Action Center of Reform Judaism. Uh, she has developed social justice programming, including community engagement opportunities for all age groups, um, and is a recipient of several awards from uh, UJA and, and JTS. Um, again, Sarah, it is wonderful to um, be able to learn with you tonight and uh, um, welcome you back, you back to, to BJ. Thanks, Dave. Well, I sort of hated that. I hated hearing that bio. <laughs> um, okay, this is so fun. Um, these are people, um, so many beloved people from my two spiritual homes. So it's like such, it's just, this is so wonderful to get to see everyone together. Um, the only warning I want to give to Addis people is that this material might be making a comeback during Friday Parsha this morning, not this week. So maybe you'll just be able to go la elo la elo with it. And or if you sign off now or Friday, it won't upset me. <laughs> um, okay, so we're in um, Pirke Avot chapter four. Um, if you've been coming to these other sessions, um, then you have heard of this practice of, of studying Pirke Avot during the period between Pesach and Shavuot. Um, if not, you're dropping in in the middle. So we're in chapter four. Um, there's a chapter assigned to each week. Um, and at the very end, we're going to talk a little bit about what is the connection between this material and this time of year, particularly the lead up to or the connection with Shavuot itself. Um, I put the source sheet in the chat. If you want to open it, you're welcome to. We're going to read everything out loud. So if your device doesn't work well with having two screens open and you want to keep the Zoom open, that's totally fine. Or if you want to flip back and forth or go to the source sheet, that's also fine. Um, only other note before we start is um, I see that there are a lot of people whose videos aren't on. I just want to give permission. I don't care if you're cooking dinner. I don't care if you're folding laundry. I don't care if you're driving. Um, I'm happy you're here and I would love to see your face even if you're doing one of those other things as well. And you can pop on and off as makes sense. I know I attend Zoom classes too, so I know how it works. But um, to whatever extent you're able to turn your camera on, I just find that it helps make more community and, and some richer learning together. Okay, so the big question that we're gonna be asking, you can see that this is what I titled the class at the top of the source sheet is, what's wrong with doing wrong is how I phrased it. And we'll ask various sort of um, permutations of that as we move through. But essentially the big question is why not do wrong? So there are a lot of negatives. We're gonna have a chance to ask some of the positive version of that, which is why do good? But really I think what the rabbis of, of this tractate of the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot are grappling with is, um, why why lead a, a life guided by me to vote? Why not just be sort of more liberated or free or transgress? And um, interestingly, you know, I think there's a way in which this question, um, why not do wrong? Why not transgress? Can be an end in and of itself, right? The language they're going to use sort of begins and ends with with language of me to vote and transgressions. I actually think that what they're trying to do here is unpack the theological question of theodicy. So that's the question of why bad things happen to good people. I think that's really what they're sort of um, railing against or trying to make sense of or um, at least asking or challenging. So what we're going to look at first are just 
two examples from um, one from the Torah and one from elsewhere in the Mishnah um, that lay out a pretty simple version of theodicy. So a simple version of that question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because this is the context that's in the back of the heads of the rabbis from Pirkei Avot, right? In the back of their heads, and sometimes I think even in the forefront of their mind, sometimes explicitly in the text that they encounter and they teach, is the idea, and we're going to see this inside, but we'll just state it out loud first, is the idea, if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad, right? And that sort of moves in both directions, right? The cause effect version is if you do good, good comes to you. If you do bad, bad comes to you. But it also works in some ways in the reverse, which is if something bad is happening to you, it must be because you did bad, right? That is the simplistic theology. We're gonna, again, that that is present in Jewish tradition. And we're gonna see how these rabbis, I think, this is sort of my take on this chapter, are poking holes in that. Um, so. That's it. That's the plan. We'll look first at, at a source of that theology from the Torah, from elsewhere in the Mishnah, and then we'll look at a few different um, cases from this chapter of Pirkei Avot that ask and answer in their own way what's wrong with doing wrong, pull it all together for sort of, I think, a new version of that theodicy. Um, okay, I'm going to read the first source or two, but I'm, I'm going to later ask for volunteers. So get ready to, um, if you feel comfortable reading out loud in the English, steal yourself for that. Um, so the question that we're going to ask for each of these texts, so keep it in your mind as I read, according to this text, what's wrong with doing wrong? What will happen to you if you do wrong? Okay. If you follow, this is from Leviticus 26, if you follow my laws and faithfully observe my commandments, I will grant rain in their season so that the earth shall yield its produce and the trees of the fields their fruit. Your threshing shall overtake the vintage and your vintage shall overtake the sowing. You shall eat your fill of bread and dwell securely in your land. Jumping down a few verses. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, if you reject my laws and spurn my rules so that you do not observe all my commandments and you break my covenant, I will in, I will, I in turn will do this to you. I will wreak misery upon you. Consumption and fever will cause the eyes to pine and the body to languish. You shall sow your seed to no purpose, for your enemies shall eat it. I want to say this was like the most PG version of a curse I could find <laughs> in the Torah. If this felt gnarly, it gets way gnarlier. <laughs> um, so I don't want to just give, a. Uh, I, this one is probably the simplest, but anybody want to give like a quick summary or reflection? According to this text, What's wrong with doing wrong? What will happen if you transgress? Yeah, Sarah. Everybody suffers. Yeah. Which that's is why it. I don't like this theology. That's why I don't say the second paragraph of the Shema, because I don't think it's a good theology. Yeah. Well, you and the rabbis of, of Pirkei Avot, I think, are going to end up agreeing. Um, yeah. So there are sort of two things in there, right? The first is this piece that I've already drawn out, which is, um, if you do bad, bad will happen. But you also said something about the collective here, right? If I do bad, it seems like there's something um, that will happen to the collective that is bad, right? This actually has a little bit of personal punishment too, like consumption and fever. Those are things in, in the body. Um, there is this, the body will languish. There is that language. Um, and right elsewhere, we have like the rains and the, the enemies rain. and the crops, like it's not just a one-to-one. -one. So, right, so maybe part of the answer then here to why not do wrong um, is actually so that other people don't suffer, right? Maybe it's it's a, I don't know, I don't know if that redeems it. It doesn't fully, but that helps me a little bit with it at least, but it's okay to not like this. Again, I think that this is what they have in their heads and what they're gonna end up railing against. Um, any other reactions to this one? Yeah, Helen. Uh, I thought about the family. You know, it mostly looks like uh, it will endanger your family. Everyone who depends on you. Yeah. It's where the third and the fourth generation probably will be affected. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And does that make, does that, how do you feel about that? Does that help 
this theology for you or it still feels kind of problematic? I, I I keep thinking about Job, you know, you know, like he he suffered for nothing, you know, yeah. he didn't do any bad. Yeah, bad things. he still yes. suffered. So I don't know what to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me neither. These rabbis neither. That's a lot of what we're going to see. You know, um, I was actually talking to somebody recently who was saying like the book of Job is the most important book in Tanakh um, because it sort of takes all of these ideas that feel so fundamental in the Torah. And it basically says life doesn't work that way, <laughs> which yeah. like anybody who's lived life, I think can agree with. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, like if the Torah just said nothing about all of this, that might be less opening than for the Torah to say something and for them to us see that being challenged. You know, in, in the book of Job, we see that challenge in sort of what feels like a narrative way. Like we see a life unfolding in a way that doesn't conform to this kind of one-to-one -one formula. Um, I think what we're going to see in these sources is less a narrative version and more of like an intellectual sort of challenge to that. Um, but I think having Job in the back of our mind to pair with this is, that's really great. That adds a lot. I mean, you know, he he got everything back at the end, you know, he, he actually persevered <laughs> to the end, but suffering is based on the, on, on the passage that we just, you know, we just read, he, he was not supposed to have any, any of it. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep Job in mind when we get to the very last text. Um, okay, I'm going to read one more from the Talmud. So this is, um, I, I pulled it from the Gemara. So that's the compendium. We know this that later comments on the Mishnah, but this actually comes from the Mishnah. And the reason why I'm being clear about that is that Pirkei Avot is a tractate of the Mishnah. So something that was from the Gemara commenting on the Mishnah, the Mishnah rabbis of Pirkevo might not necessarily have it in their mind, but this is part of that same canon. These ideas are sort of floating around at the same time. So I think it is reasonable to imagine that the rabbis of Pirkevo chapter four, who we're going to be spending our time with, had encountered, if not this exact text, at least this idea. So this is from the Mishnah in Kiddushin. Anyone who performs one mitzvah has goodness bestowed upon him. His life lengthens and he inherits land, i.e. life in the world to come. Anyone who does not perform one mitzvah does not have goodness bestowed upon her. Her life is not lengthened and she does not inherit the land of the world to come. Um, I'm just going to like leave that. We're not going to talk a ton about it um, because I really want us to get to what I was actually asked to teach on, <laughs> which was Mishnah Avot chapter four. But um, I just wanted us to see that, like, that feels like, uh, you know, very similar theology to the book of Leviticus, but maybe even one step further and explicitly now within the language, the system of mitzvot um, and the si similar idea of reward and punishment, right? If you do good, all these good things happen. If you not even do bad, this is sort of interesting language here, right? If you don't perform a mitzvah. So the absence of a positive, not even a full negative, but the absence of a positive here is already enough to say these good things won't happen to you. So kind of another um, iteration of that same theology. Okay, let's see what happens in this chapter. We're going to take um, one, two, three, for Mishnayot from this chapter, and we'll sort of see a progression amongst them. So again, the question that I want us to think about as we read this first one is, um, what's wrong with doing wrong? Why not, why not transgress? This is a very famous one. Ben Azai says, be quick in performing a minor commandment. Maybe we should say, be as quick in performing a minor commandment as in the case of a major one and flee from transgression for mitzvah goreret mitzvah, the avera goreret avera. One commandment, one mitzvah, one act of goodness leads to another. One avera, one transgression or sin leads to another. For the reward of performing a mitzvah is another mitzvah. And the reward or consequence of committing a transgression is a transgression. Okay, in this text, what's wrong with doing wrong? 
why not do wrong? Yeah, Sonia. Sonia, oh, oh, perfect, there you go. So by the way, you said that you would be sharing this uh, on the screen and, and um, I think you haven't so far, or maybe I haven't uh, clicked on the, the link, but anyway, if I'm remembering this correctly, um, it's it really speaks to um, habit formation. It, it, yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, which is really uh, fundamental to our character development. Yes. Yes, that is perfectly said. Just in terms of sources, I'm going to put the source sheet. Oh, thanks. Dave just did it too. Back in the chat. I I don't like sharing my screen because then I can't see your faces. So mm -hmm. I'm going to read everything out loud so you can hear it. And if you want to look at it, you can open it there. Mm -hmm. um, thank, but thank you for reminding me of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't know. There was this thing. I feel like it was like in my doctor's office or something growing up that was like, watch your thoughts because your thoughts become your actions watch your actions because your actions become your habits watch your habits because your habits become your character watch your character because your character becomes your legacy right i'm i think i'm like making up or missing some steps there but um that's kind of exactly this right the problem with doing something wrong is that it's going to be easier to do something else wrong right that's what this seems to be saying um a any opinions on this? <laughs> does that does this feel true? Does this feel like a good reason? Um, are you more convinced to not do wrong reading this than you were reading Leviticus? Like, what do we? Well, either any other interpretations of what this is saying, or any responses to it. Yeah, um, uh, Ricky, then Sarah, then Sonia. <laughs> This makes it real and understandable. It's not some amorphous thing over there. Mm -hmm. It's it's like, who are you? And who do you want to be? Yeah, that's so good, especially having just come on the heels of that one from Kidushin. Because even as I was reading the one in Kidushin, I was like, like, what's like land in the world to come? Like, <laughs> um, many people on here know I, I had a kid 10 months ago. And one of the things that I keep saying as like a change in my life since having a baby is like, I just don't care about future Sarah anymore. Like current Sarah has enough going on. And like, I used to be so nice to future Sarah. And like, she was somebody that I showed so much compassion to. And I, I did so much for her. And now like future Sarah, she's going to be fine. And even if she's not going to be fine, current Sarah just can't worry about her. So it sort of feels like in that schema, right? This idea that like, in in the world to come and the goodness bestowed it's like i don't know what that means and i don't have time for that and the world to come feels very far away and i have a lot going on right now right but what ricky was saying is like this is actually very real this is about the now and the step just after now right ricky you said who you are and then you pause and said or who you want to be and i think that's right but i think it's a very um a very close, who do you want to be, right? Not a like 30 years from now, but a like tomorrow, right? What are, What is just the next step? And that is so much easier to imagine, which I think then makes me much sort of more, like if it, that's, it, it feels like a better reason to me. Um, yeah, that was great. I hadn't thought about it like that. Um, I'm actually gonna go to Susan and then um, go to the folks who've spoken. So Susan, then Sarah and Sonia. It's also uh, says something about leadership. You know, if you have a amoral leader, um, it's it and either in a company or in or in politics, people feel, oh, if they're doing it, I can get away mm -hmm. with it. So it really has an impact on society as a whole. So it's not just an individual; it's it's a group, a large group. Yeah, that's so good. I have not thought about this in that way before, but I would always thought. Um, avera gorera avera, a transgression leads to a, a transgression, means the more I the e the more I transgress now, the easier it is to transgress in the future. But that's such a good read too. I can't believe I haven't thought about it. Like if I transgress, how much easier does it become for all the people around me to transgress? Um, that's great. I love that. Uh, Sarah. I took my hand down in the interest of hearing other voices. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sonia, go ahead. 
Okay, just um, just following what what you and um, now Susan was it uh, said, and also the sign in your doctor's office, which is amazing. That's an amazing doctor. I've never heard of that, but it stayed with you. Yeah, you, you are a rabbi, so you you know there that that makes sense. But it stayed with you, and I think it stayed with you because it has some real depth and what I the way I resonate with with what you read is that it's it feels true I know it's true for myself and I know it's true uh in in what I observe and then speaking of the modeling it you know which I, I think this Sarah was alluding to um it it uh you know others observe one behaving a certain way certainly as a parent you want to behave a certain way uh and consistently i mean let's say in the good way because uh if you don't it takes its toll on on your soul you, you know and i don't know if it becomes a habit I, but um but i think anyone who chooses to do something that they have uh, hesitation about um, we don't know what what prompts that, and 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 what kind of compromises they end up uh, making, or rationalizations they end up making in, internally. So anyway, I'm going on and on a bit, but no, just... that was that was wonderful, and I, I think that I appreciate you sharing um, how it lands with you, and I resonate with a lot of it. There was one phrase you said that I wanted, I really wanted to pull out, and now I'm I'm I've sort of lost it, but it was something like it erodes your soul or you, you feel it in your soul. So what I was going to ask about this is, can anybody help us pull apart the difference between clause number two and clause number three? So clause number two was a mitzvah leads to a mitzvah as an avera leads to an avera. Clause three is the reward for performing a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Right, the word another is actually inserted in the English. It's schar mitzvah, mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Schar avera, avera. The consequence of an avera is an avera. What's the difference between that? What's the difference between bad leading to bad and the consequence of a bad is bad? Yeah, do you want to share it? Because you sort of helped get us there. Mm -hmm. One feels authoritarian to me, and hmm. the and the other feels uh, in internal. Um, yes, yes, exactly. So I think the internal piece that was that was what I was reacting to when you talked about it, sort of eroding your soul. This idea that like what's wrong with doing wrong, right? One is it will lead to bad habits, and the other seems to be like the wrong itself feels wrong, right? The wrong itself is wrong. <laughs> and, you know, that's not about its consequence. It's not about where it leads you. It's just about this moment. Um, I'm working with the bar mitzvah kid right now. Um, what Parsha is it? I can't remember. He's sometime in the book of numbers and he's talking about the restitution sacrifice where, um, you know, if you wrong somebody, you have to repay them. And then you also have to give a fifth more so if you steal $10, you have to give $12 back. And we were talking about how, um, you know, he, I, I was asking like, why do you think that is? And he says, you know, as a deterrent and the person who um, wronged needs to, you know, give something up um, more than just what they took. And I was saying like, for the person who's receiving it, um, it's not just about being made whole from a financial perspective, like, the wrong itself left a hole, a different hole than what was taken. Like just the experience of being wronged or doing wrong leaves its own hole. Um, my car was broken into last week and my laptop was stolen and, and my headphones, whatever. It's like a whole mess. And it was one of these things where it was like insurance paid for all of it. Like I have a new laptop. I have the glass on my car. Like it's all fine. If you look at my life today, it's exactly as it was eight days ago. And it's not just about being made whole. Like they're also like, there's a something visceral and sort of almost tangible to a wrong itself. And I, that's, I think, part of what this is getting at. 
And this is, I, I was just ex- articulating that from the experience of the one who was wronged, but I think like, I mean, even maybe even all the more so, or certainly also for the one doing wrong. I think erode your soul is like a perfect phrase for this. Um, Yeah, Sarah, and then I want us to read the commentaries on this. So the doing one wrong leads to another wrong is kind of a slippery slope kind of argument, Mm -hmm. but you don't know where the fulcrum is, where Mm -hmm. in the the further down clause, the fulcrum is already here. Like you do it once, you're already beyond... Yeah, you've already crossed the line where I don't want to say there's no return because obviously there's always chuva, but it's where you can't just say, oh, OK, I'm going to stop. You mm-hmm. have to actually do restitution, do chuva. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that feels very true. Um, I do just want to say, oh, yeah, great. Great. Go ahead for, first and then also. Yeah, just really quickly, as you're as we're talking about this, it, it brings to mind the the film or the book, The Portrait of, Air, of uh, Dorian Gray. Right, so there's this, he looks perfect through his entire life, but there's a painting of him that ends up in the attic. And in the end of the film, you see that his, everything about him has been eroded and corrupted because of all the bad deeds that he has done. So the deed itself was bad, but then it's the effect on his, the, uh, on his, his very core, his being. Mm-hmm. And um, as we're talking about that, I, you know, I think about how, you you do something bad, you know, outwardly you may look the same, but inwardly there's a destruction that's taking place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Similarly, if you do something good, you're feeling good about it and, you know, makes you smile and you want to do more because it makes you feel better. But mm-hmm. that's what comes to mind when we talk about this. You may not always see it, but there is this erosion that occurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really great. And um, you know, what I was going to say before you said that, and I think you just sort of helped nuance what I was going to say a lot, is like, you know, if we go back to, you know, some discomfort around this original theodicy, this original idea of um, why why are bad things happening to good people, and, you know, the book of Leviticus saying, well, it's because they did bad, this is not that far away from that theology. I just want us to sort of notice that. Like, there is a little bit here of, if you see someone who's sort of far down the path of that erosion, this there there is some agency being ascribed here to that person, right? Some sort of fault or responsibility. And I think, Gray, what, what you just pointed out is that um, maybe it's not actually that you see it, right? I think that idea of like the external versus what's happening internally and those sort of happening on different paths, that feels really important. But I just want us to like, keep in the back of my mind, because I think what's going to happen is that they're going to move farther and farther from that Leviticus theology. I will say for me, I already feel more comfortable theologically here, even though I don't know that we've traveled such distance. Um, Okay, I want to bring these two commentaries. I bet everybody who's been teaching this class has been teaching these commentaries. This is from the new Pirkei Avot, new meaning probably five years old, which like in the scheme of Jewish history is like, you know, 744. (laughs) Um, it's um Rabbi Gordon Tucker and Rabbi Tamar Ella Applebaum. It's amazing. If you don't have this volume, I like can't recommend it more highly. So this is what each of them has to say about this Mishnah. Okay, Rabbi Tucker says, mitzvah gorer mitzvah, one commandment leads to another. This is generally a sound psychological observation. Thank you, Rabbi Tucker. It is more challenging to do something for the first time than to repeat the action over and over whether they are comfort sacrificing acts of ritual observance or acts of kindness to others or inhibition breaking acts of transgression. Once they are done for the first time, the actions are much easier to repeat. The natural reaction, depending on whether this is a positive performance or a negative violation is either, yes, I can do that comfortably or see, I can do that and get away with it. Yet again, we see Avot's concern with the power of habituation, both in education and in character formation. Sonia, so spot on for what you were saying. Okay. Schar mitzvah, mitzvah. The reward for performing a mitzvah is a mitzvah. There seem to be two different ways in which to interpret Ben Azai's words here. If this clause is connected to the previous one, it would mean that the reward for performing a mitzvah is the next mitzvah that comes in its wake while the wages of transgression are the sins that follow once one commits an initial transgression. That kind of just feels like it's like a sin, like a, it's just repeating what was said before. Okay, then he says, 
Alternatively, it can be understood to mean that the reward that comes to us from a mitzvah is that mitzvah itself, and the wages of transgression inhere in the sinful act itself. We are told that we look in the wrong place for a mitzvah's reward if we look to an ac external source, precisely because the reward is intrinsic to the act itself. Okay. Now this um, uh, Rabbi Tamar piece, commandment and transgression are two guides to the spiritual and moral topography of life, enabling the learner to identify the openings through which one may profitably pass on the one hand and the walls that will constitute dead ends on the other. Choose an opening, any opening at all, teaches Ben Azai, and avoid the walls as best you can. Indeed, flee from them. Life consists of the dynamic alternation of pursuit and flight as the student of Torah moves back and forth in the world in an ongoing effort to approach what is essential for learning and to move away from whatever might inhibit the ability to discern and understand. This motion is necessitated by the fundamental human inability to know the full consequence of every action. And it also grows from our humility in recognizing that we can never learn everything there is to learn. Every moment in life is thus to be taken as a kind of ephemeral understanding of some specific thing that must lead to further unfolding comprehension in subsequent moments in order for moral progress to be sustained. Okay, any reactions to any of that before we move to the next Mishnah? Okay, um, oh, just, just as I moved over, so I hand it. yeah, Kelsey. Sorry, I was trying to find the hand raise button. Um, this is this is maybe uh, a silly connection to make, but I just finished watching Jewish Matchmaking on Netflix, and for me, don't the, spoil it because I'm only episode four. No, no, no spoilers. But for me, the thing that it really brought home was how not only are the levels of observance among Jews worldwide so varied, but the level of observance that people have in their own lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have people who went from ultra Orthodox to studying in Yeshiva to being secular, but still keeping coat. Like it's just, it, it varies so much in your relationship with Judaism and with mitzvot change so much during a life. And I think that's kind of what this made me think of is like, you're just, we're all human and we're just kind of all trying our best. Right. Um, and we realize that we'll go through t like periods where we do more mitzvot or less mitzvot, but, um, I don't know. I, I quite like this text. I think it's, it recognizes the, um, you know, I like that phrase, the dynamic alternation of pursuit and flight mm -hmm. and moving back and forth in the world. Um, I just think it recognizes kind of the, the human aspect to religion. Mm -hmm. I love that. Actually, I think that was a great connection. Um, and, you know, I think that what that helped me realize is that this idea of avera gorer avera or of mitzvah gorer mitzvah, of one thing leading to the next, on the one hand, it makes things more intractable, right? Because it says like, the more the more good you do, the fur the deeper in the good you are. And the more bad you do, right, the farther off the derech you have gone. On the other hand, what this seems to say is like, just do the next best thing, right? It's this is not this is not saying do meets vote, right? Actually, sort of interestingly, we only ever have these words in the plural here, right? Right now, are you gonna do a mitzvah or do an avera? And then, then at 751, are you going to do a misfer or do an Avera, right? And it's it sort of says like our paths actually, it's, it's sort of like an infinite number of forks and you're never fully down one path or fully down the other path because you can always do the next one good thing. Um, yeah, Alan, Ben, Helen, um, and then we're going to go to the next one. But when does this end, Dave? When you want it to. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're scheduled <laughs> to go until, uh, until 8.30. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so Alan and Helen, go ahead. I, I, I was struck by Rabbi Tamar's commentary mainly because I, it, I, I think it seems counterintuitive in some ways to um, at least what Judaism in, in its traditional sense has taught. Um, you know, when she talks about openings versus walls, um, at least the way I grew up, which was in a more orthodox synagogue and orthodox surroundings, you know, openings were the way people escaped um, 
into uh, transgression. Mm -hmm. And the walls mm -hmm. were the things that kept people uh, from, uh, that kept people bounded mm -hmm. um, and, and kept people um, from uh, uh, behaving badly, if mm -hmm. you will. And she sort of takes that and turns it around. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the truth is that both are both, right? Like mm -hmm. we need walls and they bound us. And that it's like, like everything that's their blessing and their curse. But I, you're so right to point that out. I mean, I, I think many people here are familiar with her. She is remarkable and how she's able to like turn things upside down and back again and open and close like you know so seamlessly that after she talks you're usually just like, <laughs> like there's nothing really to do but just sort of sit awestruck um but yeah that's a that's a really good observation um Helen last comment on this one yeah thank you Raj. I, I I hope to be very quick yeah what struck me it's uh your your approach to walls and the openings as well uh, but humility and understanding that we never know what is a transgression. That's that's how I see it, the walls and the openings. Mm -hmm. We don't know mm -hmm. what is transgression. We don't really know what is the good de deed, you know, or the, the right thing to do. So just look for something that's going to be the most profitable. Mm. Of course, I think she means profitable from the perspective that you're going to continue living and pros prospering, you know, in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, like, people around you are going to be doing the same the same thing but take take the um le least difficult way you know to to kind of move forward with mm -hmm. your yeah I mean it's so interesting right because you know I said this at the very beginning in in a different context of like these rabbis are going to be talking in the language of mitzvot right mitzvah and avera this language of um commandments and transgressions and in that realm, it's actually very clear what is a mitzvah and what is an avera. And I also was struck by something in her commentary where she talked about like, this is really about the fundamental human inability to know the consequences of our actions, right? Like I think anytime you see the rabbis asserting something uber forcefully, <laughs> they probably are pushing up some against some sort of psychological or spiritual discomfort. So the more uncertainty they feel, the more they feel the need to assert, this thing causes this thing, right? And I think that she unpacks that in a way that feels very true. So maybe it's clear in the realm of mitzvah and avera, but in the realm of actual good and bad in the world, it's you can't, It's so much more uncertain. So yeah. that's, that's she's, a great- she's very, Yeah, she's very subtle. And mm -hmm. she, she, that's what she brings, you know, be- uh, it's humility in us to, to understand that we will never understand what is right is what is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, so yeah. Kind of Great. Take the um, right path that you at least kind of feel that it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Does somebody want to read in English the pure care vote four eight? We're in the middle of page three. I can do it. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. Rabbi Yossi said, all those who show honor to the Torah will be personally honored by other people, but all those who treat the Torah disrespectfully will be personally disrespected by other people. Okay. What, what's wrong with doing wrong? What will happen to you if you'll do wrong? Why not transgress? You will be shunned. Sort of, yeah. You'll be exiled. You won't be part of the community anymore. Yeah. Well, yes, it's either that or it's something that I can't tell if it's better or worse, which is you'll be treated badly within the community. Well, uh, you'd probably leave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of interesting to think, right? Like in a world with a sort of more closed community. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I think that the threat might be even more real, right? If like, you know, this is a community that's in exile, like there are not, there are not a ton of, you know, other shoals across the country they can move to. So this idea that um, if you treat the Torah disrespectfully, 
you will then be disrespected by others. That probably, that, that probably was a very real consequence. I, I agree. I guess it's a pedagogical question, sort of like yeah. your final goal, because someone might just, even in community, even in the times when, you know, when it's easy to be Jewish, it's hard to be Jewish. When it's hard to be Jewish, it's easy to be Jewish. You might just leave Judaism altogether and mm-hmm. go out and be, you know, fake whatever is around you. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and be lost from the tribe forever. And that's not the outcome. I don't, that's not the outcome. I don't think we're looking for. Right. Um, right. But it could happen. Yeah. What do people think about this one? Is it a good reason to not do wrong? Does it feel real to you? Does it feel prescriptive? Does it feel descriptive? How does it compare to some of the other explanations we've seen? Do you feel like this is something that shows up in your life as a reason to not do wrong in any way? Yeah, Alan. I think it was written for its time and for its day. I, I don't know that it I don't know that it's as applicable in most people's lives, most most Jews' lives today, perhaps unfortunately, but um uh you know for 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 those who are regular synagogue goers and for those who are part of the community, um I think it's probably um unlikely that they would find themselves in a situation where their fellow congregants would know that they had disrespected the Torah. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So I want to say two things to that. The first is that's definitely correct when we understand disrespect to the Torah in a, in a sort of narrow sense here, which is, I think what they were talking about. So it's not wrong to read it that way. I think we can ask a question that's like, you know, understands Torah a little bit more expansively, which is like the reason to not do wrong in all realms of life is that you will be personally disrespected by other people. Um, Although one of the things that you were saying that I, that, that I was like, how did I sort of not see it in this way before? There is something that's a little bit, um, I don't know, like sort of circuitous or like preaching to the choir about this, which is like, if you dis- are disrespecting Torah, do you care that the Torah disrespects you? <laughs> right? I mean, I know it's not exactly that, right? It's saying it's not saying the Torah will disrespect you. It's saying that there's some sort of community in which you w- won't be a part of. So it's not quite as flippant as I'm making it seem. But there is some element to it here that feels like, and the rabbis fall into this trap all the time because their authority is so fundamentally limited and they just bump up against that all the time. But there is something that's a little bit sort of catch-22 about this, which is like, okay, if you leave the community, then you've left the community. Congratulations, Mishnah Avot, for that insight. Um, David, Carla, Susan, Sarah. I don't have the Hebrew in front of me, so I don't know how free one is. But sometimes there's an inside versus outside meaning to these psukim. And can it mean how I would feel inside me in relationship to my own assessment of myself, Mm -hmm. really without regard to any of the rest of you, or any of the rest of the people around me. Can the Hebrew let me go that far? I definitely think so, right? I think one of the things that's interesting here is the language is, is really parallel. Ha-mechalel et torah the one who curses, disdains the Torah, gufo mechulal, that person will be disrespected. That's in the passive voice. There's no subject there, which I think leaves the subject open to interpretation exactly in the way that you said. You know, one of the things I had noticed about this before is, is what's wrong here that you will get disrespect? Or is what's wrong here that you will become the sort of person worthy of disrespect? And you are right to notice that that kind of both assessment and consequence is as much about the person themselves and their experience as it is the communal response. Uh, Carla. Yeah, I'm not going to try to narrow this completely, but I'm thinking along the lines of what if you're dealing with someone who's 
disrespect of Torah is actually in an attempt to gain some sort of honor or respect for themselves. They are stepping out, and this is basically a, an opposite reaction. Don't think if you disrespect Torah to have this gain on the other side, that it will lead to a gain without a measure of disrespect. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a very valid challenge, right? As I was reading this out loud, the Daily this morning was about the E. Jean Carroll trial, and they were playing some of um, former President Trump's, like, deposition tapes, right, in which he was saying, like, celebrities have all, right, this was, like, some of the Access Hollywood stuff and his thoughts about it. He was like, yeah, like, celebrities have always gotten away with this kind of thing. And so as I was saying, like, if you disrespect Torah, you'll be disrespected by other people. It's like, I kind of wish that were true, but I don't know that that's how it always works. And I think, right, like I think one of the things that the rabbis play around with all the time is how much are they being descriptive versus prescriptive, right? How much is this, a ref- how much are they reflecting society and how much are they aspirationally building society? So maybe this is aspirational. This is them aspiring rather than observing. Um, Susan. Susan, you're muted. Sorry, maybe it's trying to get someone to change. Like if if a husband refuses to give uh, his wife a get, and they're trying to pressure him to to change, maybe, maybe this is the way for the community to, to force him. And and Mm -hmm. I don't know what the result would be, but yeah, method. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example of like, using the constraints that everybody's bought into i like manipulating isn't really the right word there or it has bad connotations but like using the system to advance the system or to enforce the system right that's sort of in some ways the complement to what alan was saying right like what i reflected back to alan was like if you don't care then you don't care congratulations but this is saying if you care then you care so that then becomes something useful um, Sarah, and then um, we'll read this one little text and then go to the third one. I can't believe this didn't jump out me first, but two years ago, two summers ago, I read three biographies of Spinoza. Mm-hmm. And so this is kind of a flip on that. You know, nothing he said would bother any of us Jews today. And yet he was ostracized from his community for mm-hmm. disrespecting the Torah. Mm-hmm. And so Sometimes, you know, if you think outside the box in the wrong time, wrong place in the wrong time, you get ostracized when actually, you know, 200 years later, you're good to go or 400 years later, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think that what that is getting at is like, what does it mean to Mechalel et HaTorah, right? And that's actually, you know, we sort of see this all the time. Like, that's something that's so subjective. Like, is women of the wall, Michal Elad HaTorah. Some people would say yes. Some people would say it's Kavod HaTorah, right? Mechabed HaTorah. It's honoring Torah. Um, and so I think, right, some of this is saying like, how much can you trust the reaction of something to tell, as a tell to whether or not it in and of itself is good, what was inherently good or bad? Um, and again, that's like, is this descriptive or is this aspirational? Um, okay, the one I just brought this like Freakonomics thing because I thought that it was kind of an interesting affirmation of this. So it says one thing that's a fairly good general rule is that we believe very much societally in the power of moral incentives, urging people to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Or we can say conversely, don't do wrong, don't do bad because it's bad. Okay, he says the data show that that rarely works. Ha <laughs> ha. It doesn't mean people are immoral. It just turns out that moral incentives typically are not very successful, which doesn't mean they won't work in some cases. Financial incentives are hardly, are, aren't necessarily better, but social incentives are often really strong, what you might call the herd mentality. If you want people to do, quote unquote, the right thing, whatever that is, you don't tell them you should do this because you'll be a better person for it. It's the right thing to do. That will typically produce a much weaker outcome than if you simply tell people, Did you know that a lot of your neighbors or people in your community are doing this thing? You might want to think about doing it too. And that kind of herd mentality or social incentive is typically stronger than a moral incentive. So I think we can like 
<laughs> there are pros and cons to this reflection, right? This can be used for better and it can be used for worse. I was just listening to something about like peer pressure and teenagers, like this herd mentality is not a universally positive thing. And if peer, peer K a vote is seeing itself as a pedagogic tool, right? It's seeing itself as trying to um, incentivize or encourage or guide people toward positive behavior, a life of meets vote, maybe they're just taking this true thing about the world, this observation about herd mentality, and they're orienting it for good, you know, knowing that it also can be used for bad. So I just thought that was kind of um, an interesting twist on this. Okay, third text. Um, so this is going to take us back a little bit to this theodicy question, um, because this text for the first time, I think, is going to have a different sort of spin on human agency. I will say it's a bit of an opaque text. So I want us to read um, the text and Rabbi Tucker's commentary at the same time. So I'll read them. This is um, a vote, chapter four, Mishnah 13. Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yaakov said, one who performs a single mitzvah, ha'osei mitzvah achat, konel lo praklit echat, acquires a defender in God's heavenly court. But one who commits a transgression, ha'over avera, acquires a, pot, a prosecutor in that same courtroom. Repentance and good deeds are protection against retribution. Okay, so Rabbi Tucker says, it is natural to think of the arena of advocacy and accusation referenced here as that of the posthumous judgment that awaits us all in the heavenly tribunal. And the bracket, the brackets that had inserted in God's heavenly court, that's uh that's not trans, that's not direct translation. That's already interpretation. But that is not the only possible reading. The Mishnah can also be understood to refer to what we call today the court of public opinion. On what does one's reputation most depend? What can advocate on behalf of a person in the minds of others and what might indict an individual? The answer given here is that how a person acts in the world is the primary determinant of how he or she will be judged. We are taught that the very best advocate that one, that's a typo, can have for oneself is acquired with the currency of mitzvot and that the most potent accuser one can face is the one who is activated and empowered by misdeeds. Okay, before we get to the last sentence here, repentance and good deeds are protection against retribution. Just with this one who commits a transgression acquires a prosecutor or one who performs a mitzvah acquires a defender. In that sense, how would we answer the question, what's wrong with doing wrong? What happens when you do something bad? I don't have any idea what this might mean. Either you can agree or disagree with one of Rabbi Tucker's um, interpretations or just how, what, what do you think this means just reading it yourself? Yeah, Sarah. I'm a little unclear if if I do two good deeds, do I get two defenders? Like, is it a tally? Or, um, I mean, because most of us would go in with one of each if, you know, if you only, if one gets one and one gets the other and then you're done tallying. Um, but I don't know, it's, that's what I'm asking, is it a tally? It's a good question. I mean, you can imagine it's becoming a very full courtroom if it is. You have like 55 million defense attorneys and 71 million prosecutors <laughs> over the course of a lifetime. Maybe they cancel themselves out and then it's just like what's left. But I don't know. What else? What, what do you make? What do you, what do you think this means? <laughs> As I told you that it's a bit opaque. I'm not certain what it means. One who commits a transgression acquires a prosecutor. Yeah, Helen, what do you think this might mean? I don't know what what I read from that. It's like a balance, you know. So you put one piece of equal weight on the one scale and the other one on the other one. So it balances, and the more the better, the better, you know. The more the more you put on the on the right thing, it's it's gonna be overweighing what is what is wrong with you because you you're gonna be doing something wrong as well. Yeah, that's so interesting because. That would lead to an answer of the question, why, what's wrong with doing wrong? Is it's like, ugh, then you're going to have to make up for that, all that wrong with like a bunch of good deeds. And yeah. who has, yeah. who has if, time if for can, all those good maybe, deeds? If we, if we have time, maybe yeah. we do not have time to, to do it. Yeah, so better kind of 
be, be ready to go somewhere any time in your life. So better do something good. You you will have at least something to show, you know. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there's a way in which like this, if I were sort of smiling, like there's a way in which it's a little bit flippant, but there also is a way in which saying like the problem with doing wrong is that any wrong that you're doing is like, like time is a, is a fixed resource, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that is filling time in which you are otherwise would have been doing a good thing. And there's, you know, there is sort of this sense, like Rabat Tamar talked in one of them about um, this is about about noticing like what's ephemeral and that feels like that's part of this conversation um Sarah so going back oh, to the telly thing it yeah, also Sarah makes Brooks me... and then Sarah Levin. oh no I'm go so ahead sorry. no no go 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 um, just are some I know we're not supposed to say this but are some you know uh, transgressions worse than others you know if I eat a bacon cheeseburger it harms me if I kill somebody, it harms, you know, not only the person I murdered, but, you know, the people who loved that person. Um, so that's not addressed at all here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that is a very valid challenge. I want like, and I agree much more with the challenge than with any response to it. I will say that if we're trying to make sense of like, what are they getting at? If they sort of like, what is this enormous blind spot that they seem to have with, with regards to that? And I wonder if there's something about like, and this goes back to the very first one, just the act of transgressing does something to you and your spirit. This is saying like, don't even, you don't have, have to go any farther than this, <laughs> than right here to, for doing bad to already that's like kind of the eroding your soul piece. Um, and that's both totally incomplete and also totally incomplete, right? It's like the whole, not, it's like a drop in the bucket of the story and also in some ways the whole story. Um, Sarah Levin. I was pretty much going to say what you just said. Um, oh, um, and just, just that the prosecutor can be an infernal prosecutor. Mm -hmm. That's who the prosecutor could be. Mm -hmm. And that really prosecuting and then defending, actually, I mean, a whole dynamic going on inside about doing wrong. Yeah, so I love, I love that image. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like the cliche, like devil and angel on your shoulders. And part of what I was thinking as you were saying that is like, the devil and the angel, and we can, you know, talk about if we think the defender and the prosecutor are this too, like, they they live in extremes, right? Like part of what this imagined prosecutor is doing, I don't want to talk about like actually what is the job of a prosecutor, but part of what this, I think, imaginary prosecutor is doing is saying um, like this one wrongdoing, that's who this person is, that's their character, right? That's all these things about them. Like there is this sense of like this one misdeed in the eyes of the prosecutor, their job is to make that the whole story. And so in that way, like what's wrong with doing wrong? Because actually even one bad thing can become the whole story, right? That's like part of, I think that's part of what the prosecutor image can do here. Um, Carla, then Gray. I think, uh, I think about a phrase that I've used a lot actually too, one that your character speaks for you and that the best way to know who somebody is is to look at how they've behaved over time. Mm -hmm. And that last one I learned from a friend after some very hard lessons mm -hmm. in dealing with somebody. Um, and it's indiv an individual action can only prosecute you so far. The more of them you do, the evidence yeah. stacks up. Yeah. And especially dealing with being disabled, I've sometimes had people do something in a hurtful way but with a very good heart mm -hmm. and i've also had people come and tell me they're going to be very good and find out they have a very cold heart mm -hmm. and what i look at is is this a one-off do i see generally yeah there are deeds testifying that they are a good person who maybe just said something the wrong way or did something the wrong way yeah. or is this somebody that has a string of hurt people in their trail. Yeah. 
and your deeds testify and people notice even if you don't. Yeah, that's great and really important. And I think that this language actually, you're so right, really helps us get us there because, right, like, I mean, back sort of back to this trial, like this idea of like establishing a pattern that really bolsters a case. And I think part of what, and and Sarah's, Sarah Levin's comment got us here too, like part of what this mission seems to be grappling with is how much is it about one deed and how much is it about what one deed reflects about who you are. And prosecutor, defender, that's a really interesting context to think about this in, right? Because I think that elsewhere in, I was going to say elsewhere in Pirkei vote, but actually elsewhere in this Mishnah itself, <laughs> there is the sense that no person is defined by one deed, right? No person is defined by their worst day or whatever it is. And if you one time, just one time murder someone, like the prosecutor is still going to prosecute you, you know? And so there is a little bit of this tension here. Um, Gray, then we'll move on to the um, to the last one. And yes, as you were talking and everyone else, it, I think of it one way is that God is both the prosecutor and the defender mm. of your actions. You know, when, when we come along to um, Yom Kippur, you know, you know the, you're written in the book of life, you're written in the book of death, your actions. And, you know, you can't just wave a wand and say, OK, I'll be better next year. We've been talking about patterns and such. But I mean, who's the ultimate prosecutor? For us, if, if you believe in God, and it's God, and you're either rewarded at the end, or he prosecutes you, and you're not rewarded, whatever that means. I don't believe in an afterlife. My mother taught me that your heaven and hell is here on earth, and you make it it's through your deeds, good or bad. But I think as, I, as I'm listening to everybody, the thought that God may in fact be the prosecutor and the defender, I, I could think of it that way. Yeah. So I want to re respond to two pieces of that. The first is I feel like your mom is one of the rabbis of Mishnah Avot chapter four, because um, that feels like really what, what they're living in here. The other is this I, invoking the high holidays, which I think is so, so present here. You know, one of my favorite teachings about the, the high holidays is that what we're doing with Avinu Malkenu, which is like the anthem of the high holidays, is a parent and a king or a parent and a sovereign are the two categories of people who are disqualified from serving judgment. Like if I were appearing before a court and the judge was my parent, they have to recuse themselves. And if I was appearing before someone and that person became king or I was somehow appearing before the king, that person, kings are not allowed to administer justice or administer judgment. Hopefully they're administering justice. Um, and so there is this way in which like, and I think we see this in the second half here, there's a way in which we hope or imagine God is actually being outside of, of that judgment process. I think in some ways, Greg, you're totally right that like there are, there are strands of the tradition that see God as the ultimate judge and the ultimate arbiter. Um, and I think part of what we plead for is a version of God that isn't administering strict judgment, but that is more capacious than that. And so that's part of why, so it's the last line in this one that I think begins to turn the corner away from that original simplistic theodicy. And that's this idea here <clears throat> that tshuva and ma'asim tovim, repentance and good deeds are protection against retribution, right? That there's something here that's like, that begins to break down that binary of you do good, good happens. You do bad, bad happens. Good leads to good, and then you're on the good path, and then you do more good, and good things keep happening in Yashakoach, or you do bad things, and then you do more bad things, and now you're doomed, and there are all these prosecutors, and, you know, bad, 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 bad. This says there, it's not, it's not that clean, right? There's much more, there's much more fluidity moving between paths, and so if you are receiving bad in this moment, um, or if you're acting bad in this moment, 
there are there are chances to sort of change your fate. Like there's an element of human agency here that I think begins to really push against that, like your crops are gonna die from Leviticus piece. Um, Jeffrey, and then I, I wanna- uh, uh, Jeffrey, so may I ask David, a question? Oh, um, sure, David, David, go ahead. Look, if, if, I can, if I'm allowed to interpret this internally, then like my last question, either because it's passive or otherwise, and then this proclete, and then this this this, uh, this uh, prosecutor, or then this defender, isn't you or somebody else or somebody assigned in heaven or by God or the, by the community or anything? It's me. Mm -hmm. It's me, and yeah. I'm judging myself. And it's think of depression. Think of psychological depression. Something is making me think about myself, this one deed done or this one deed failed to do or what have you, and it's depressing me. What's the effect of depressing me? Well, that has a very tangible effect. I mean, that's what we, we see that all the time psychologically. And can't the, this discussion be as much talking about that or the, in addition to anything else, that that's yes. what the issue is. Yes, I think it absolutely can. I think everything you said feels spot on to me. And, you know, as we were reading this together here, I was thinking like, wow, does it, fami does it feel familiar to do one bad thing and then become your own prosecutor, <laughs> right? To then, you know, I was with, I was with somebody today who, um, is an absolutely wonderful person, one of the best of the best. And this person forgot something that they were supposed to do for their child and was just beating themselves up about it, could not get out of this spiral of like, I'm horrible. I was like, you're actually the best. <laughs> and you forgot this one thing because you're a human and you have too much on your plate. But I watched this person become their prosecutor in in the in a split second, right? From Avera Echat, from one little thing. So I think what you're saying feels very true. Um, Jeffrey, then Sonia, and then I'm gonna wrap us up. Uh so hi, Sarah. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Um, so I think that the notion of making God as the prosecutor, the judge of um of guilt and innocence is much more of a Christian concept than a Judaic concept. Um, I think that given the covenant um, between God and, and humans in Judaism, I think that um, it's much more of a interrelationship and a personal judgment thing about yourself in Judaism than than putting it on God um, or however you conceive of God. So um, I just want to throw that into the, to the discussion. Yeah. I mean, I can't comment on Christianity because I didn't spend five years studying that, but Judaism has that and also not that, right? Like the entire Mahzor says that God is the judge. And at the same time, there are all of these elements already pushing back against it. So I think you're, what you're saying is true and the reverse of it also. Like everything in Judaism, you can find that idea reflected and also it's opposite reflected. So I think that's that's true with that too. Well, we don't pray for specific, um, give me this, I'll do that. Um, there's not the concept of confession. There's not the concept of... Um, uh, I can't remember the art historical term, but people would pay into a certain amount and then they would get into heaven. We don't, there's just not those concepts in Judaism. It's, 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 I think there's a significant difference. I haven't spent five years studying Christianity either, but I have some, spent some time. And I think the religions are different in that sense, or at least how I understand Judaism. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right that the weight that those pieces are given feels really different, or at least like that strand of Judaism, especially now is not given a ton of weight. 
And I think that, you know, in, even in some of these sources, if not elsewhere in pure chaos vote, if not elsewhere in the tradition, there are, you do see in, 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 in a not insignificant amount, this idea of like what it takes to get into the world to come. And the sac this idea of um, garnering merit through deeds for eternal reward, like it's not, that's not everything. And I think that this, my, my, what I'm trying to do here is show, is show a challenge to that idea. And that idea does feel present. Um, okay, Sonia, go ahead. And then I want us to read the last one, 827. Oh, okay. Um, I just appreciated, Sarah, that you, that you highlighted uh, after a fair amount of discussion on the, um, the prosecutor and the defender, that you highlighted this last line, repentance and good deeds are protection against retribution. And I wanted to say, or ask you, um, and now I'm exposing my ignorance, um, but that that line sounds so familiar to me from the Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, but I think Yom Kippur service, and it brings to mind, you know, ultimately with that line um, that that we're taught to um, to believe in God's compassion. I mm -hmm. mean, that word hasn't come up, but it's the compassion of God, not the judging and the cruel and the punishing. God so much that we do that enough to ourselves yeah yeah so with that repentance that really helps us to grow morally yeah so that resonance that you're hearing is absolutely here right the line here talks about chuva uma sim tovim the line from the yom kippur from ha holiday liturgy from unatan tokev uta chuva uta fila utsadaka ma'avirin et roa hagzera Chuva, repentance, tefila, prayer, and tzedaka, acts of justice, avert the severity, reduce, change, alter the, the severity of the decree. So very similar. And I think in both cases, right, there's this context of this court and you do good and you get good, right? In a court, the idea of a court is to punish bad wrongdoing with wrong consequences. And as soon as we put ourselves in that context, we say, but it's not actually that simple. There's a path back. There's understanding a bigger context. There's appealing to compassion, right? That it's not just as simple, even from the human agency perspective and the human construction perspective of do good, get good, do bad, get bad. No, do bad and then change who you are. Notice the effects, like all of these other pieces. I think we see the rabbi struggling to bring that in. Okay, last mission from this section, um, from this chapter, I feel like, what I, what I just sort of, I was sort of bowled over when I saw this. Okay, Rebbe Yanai Omer, Rebbe Yanai said, Ein beyadenu, lo mishalvat harishayim, velaf, ve'af lo mi yisorei hatzadikim. It is not in our hands. It is not in our capacity to explain or understand the serenity of the wicked or the suffering of the righteous. And I feel like what the rabbis were doing here is they were saying like, yeah, we just spent a lot of time telling you that good things are gonna make good things and that bad things are gonna make bad things. But at the end of the day, the world does not work that way. And we can't comprehend it and we can't understand it. And you know, I think that that has the potential to sort of lead them to this like nihilistic place. And that's what we see them, I don't know, sort of holding onto, like pushing up against as this all goes through. But I feel like this is sort of when it's like, the game is up, right? We've said all these things and it's important to say them and habit formation is good and moral incentives are good and building strong community is good and all these things are good and you can do it all right and it's not going to guarantee anything. And you can do it all wrong and succeed. And that like, it, we actually can't explain that in a neat package as much as the last 14 Mishnayot have tried to try. So I know it's 831, but I just, this is an amazing commentary on it, which is what I'm going to leave us with. The rabbis of the Talmud say, schar mitzvah, mitzvah. That was that very first one we saw, right? The reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. That is to say, God gave us commandments so that we might therefore 
cleave to God. Thus, the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah. There's going to be a play on words here. That is tzavta, so playing on mitzvah, tzavta, joining together. In Aramaic, it's joining together. For by means of performing a mitzvah, one cleaves with God, and there is no greater reward than that. And so I think what this does to this sort of journey, this juxtaposition of this kind of theodicy with like Ein Biyadenu, we can't understand it, is to say the universe is random. The universe is also unfair. It's beyond our comprehension. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. And sometimes good things happen to bad people. And there's only so much agency. We have agency, right? Chuva ma'asim tawim, but none of that is a guarantee. What is in our control? Who and what it is that we cling to, right? It's that dveku. It's that cleaving with God, that drawing close of something precious that will guide us, that's the piece that we, that is biyadenu, that is something that we can control. And this idea of dveikut, of that sort of cleaving, of that clinging, that's one of the central moments, the central themes of Shavuot, of the book of Ruth, right? Who does Ruth cling to when life is unfair to her, right? Who do the Jewish people, what do the Jewish people cling to, cleave to, throughout all of their sufferings, right? It's not only about understanding it. It's not only about comprehending it and um, asserting agency over it. It's also about when that happens, what is it that is close by us? Um, who and what are we clinging to? And I think in that sense, it's a sort of a perfect text as we move into um, receiving Torah, the story of Ruth and the experience of Shavuot. So it's sort of amazing to get to make that connection. Okay, this was so beautiful. Thank you all so much for sharing and for this opportunity. If you're from either community and you want more time with these texts, you're welcome to Friday Parsha. <laughs> the, the link's on Addis's website. Um, but um, I think Dave had a few announcements to wrap us up. I know we're a little over time, so folks have to sign off. Go ahead. Yes, of course. That's all right. I think we stopped. Uh, we started a few minutes late, Perfect. so the, your 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 timing is exactly right. Um, but uh, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for such a such a wonderful uh, wonderful teaching tonight. And again, whether you're you found us from from BJ or from Addis or from so, somewhere else, uh, thanks for being with us tonight. This series continues oh. next week when we'll be learning uh, with Rabbi Jonah Geffen. Um, another uh, former Marshall T. Meyer rabbinic fellow at, at BJ, and uh, we'll be getting in, digging into the, the fifth chapter um, from, from Pure Kevot. Um, but uh, again, Rabbi Sarah Krinsky, thank you uh, for, for tonight, and wish everyone uh, an Erev Tov. And thank you, Dave, for organizing and corralling all of these errant fellows. <laughs> like, it's awesome to bring all these communities together. It's, 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 one, it's wonderful to, to, to see everyone. So uh, I let you all everyone have a good night. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Bye. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Sarah.